I'm very happy, therefore, to sort of uh, invite up our, Arturo Calvo. So Arturo uh, was a collaborator of us, ours in, in ADAPT. We, we had a, a lot of uh, uh, interesting discussions, uh, bridging between sort of innovation, computer science, and, uh, and ethics, and had some interesting outcomes out of that. And then uh, Arturo went and got into a proper job, uh, working for uh, Accenture in Norway. So we're delighted he's made the journey uh, over to come and talk to us today about how he's been carrying on sort of evangelizing about uh, ethics in the innovation space. So I'm sure I invite you up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Dave. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for making the effort of uh, being here so early today. And um, uh, I would like to congratulate as well uh, Dave, Russell, Harris, and uh, the rest of the uh, ADAPT team uh, over here for what I think uh, has been a very good uh, first day of the workshop. Uh, it's uh, always a uh, little cool to, to speak after the great uh, talks that we had yesterday, uh, great uh, free, free talks and panel discussions. So I might need to incorporate some uh, flamenco dance or something just to try to keep uh, the, the, the high standards. Um, it's, it's great to be here uh, in uh, training in ADAPT. I spent a uh, oh, little bit over two years uh, working in ADAPT, learning from uh, some of the best uh, researchers in the areas of uh, digital content and uh, machine learning, so I learned quite a lot. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great to, to be back in Dublin uh, as well. One of my best memories, uh, perhaps from, um, from my time in ADAPT, is uh, having collaborated, as uh, they said, on this uh, project that is called the Ethics Canvas. But uh, just out of curiosity, um, how many people here in the room has uh, heard uh, about this Ethics Canvas? Just uh, good. Yeah. So for the ones that uh, don't know about it, uh, so I'll quickly explain uh, what is it about. Uh, but um, yeah, myself, uh, I. My background is as well in entrepreneurship, and I founded uh, four startups in the past. And I always uh, focused on the uh, technical and uh, the business uh, perspectives of uh, running uh, a project or uh, working on, on an idea or running a business. So I was uh, I was delighted to to work together with uh, Dave, with Russell, uh, with Harsh and, and other adapt colleagues on this uh, project, that this uh, uh, brainstorming tool that uh, helps uh, entrepreneurs, uh, helps uh, innovators, researchers to reflect about the potential ethical implications of uh, their projects or their ideas at a very early stage. Um, so the Ethics Canvas, uh, well, what we can see here is uh, the online Ethics Canvas. Uh, I'm going to explain it very quickly uh, with an example that hopefully you're all familiar with that is Tinder. Uh, I see some uh, users that I can recognize here in the room. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so the, the Ethics Canvas is basically a tool for teams to, to brainstorm. So it's a collective effort. And thinking about the example of, uh, of uh, Tinder, so uh, very quickly, uh, I can explain that uh, initially we identify what are the individuals that can potentially can potentially be affected by our tool in case it's super successful, as is the case of, of Tinder right now. Uh, so we can think about uh, perhaps uh, teenagers or married people, uh, etc., different uh, groups. Uh, well, we define as well, actually, if, uh, I don't know, like a company can be affected as well, like uh, or uh, LGBT groups or religious groups, uh, in terms of like uh, communities that can be affected, and then we start brainstorming for each one of these uh, uh, segments, individuals or groups. We start uh, defining how does it affect uh, our our idea, our project. In case it's very successful, how would it uh, affect them? Uh, starting by behavior, so we can argue that uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, the users that uh, won't receive uh, many matches on, on uh, Tinder, so might feel depressed and uh, uh, there might be uh, some uh, uh, problems over there, or uh, unfortunately uh, there are some cases uh, that have been reported in the platform uh, of uh, sexual harassment uh, as well uh, in, in the tool. 
or uh, some people might be excluded as, uh, or discriminated in the in the tool. Imagine that they didn't have, for instance, the option uh, for uh, homosexuals to to uh, express their preferences. So imagine that it was only for men to women or women to men. So uh, that would definitely discriminate uh, some some groups. Then we start talking about the relationships. How does uh, our tool affect uh, relationships between? Uh, uh, individuals, uh, so will there be some cases of uh, infidelity, are we sending the wrong message to teenagers, just uh, explaining that relationships are uh, just a physical thing. Uh, the, the world views is uh, how, um, how could the perception of our uh, role in society change, so perhaps we can argue that uh, we would have more superficial relationships, for, for example. If there are some uh, uh, conflicts in, uh, in the groups that we have uh, identified. And uh, as well, um, as uh, Philip said uh, yesterday in his uh, keynote, so uh, we need to think uh, and reflect about uh, misuse, and not only misuse, but as well failure. So uh, what would happen, because uh, Tinder is uh, managing uh, a lot of uh, very extremely sensitive data. So what would happen if uh, it's hacked and all the messages are just uh, published uh, online and available to everyone. So there would be probably like a suicide of, uh, of people, uh, depressions, uh, blackmailing, it would be a disaster. So we need to take all these scenarios into account and, uh, and make sure that uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, the different resources that we have uh, that can be from energy consumption to as well data. Data is a very important asset. So uh, how is it being used and uh, how are we protecting this uh, data? And finally, uh, for this issue that we have uh, identified these potential impacts, um, we reflect, the teams reflect about uh, possible solutions, but only if they believe that it's, uh, um, it's, uh, they are compelling enough and uh, in order to do something about them. So at the end of the day, it's a decision for the teams just to see if, like, uh, do we need to do something about them or not? So the ethics canvas doesn't say if this is ethical or not. So it's the teams uh, that will evaluate it uh, based on the company culture or values, and uh, as well uh, the impact on the business of making these changes. And the idea is to bring about uh, pivots or changes in the, in the solution uh, based on this uh, uh, on these uh, solutions uh, that uh, we re reflect about. So this is in a nutshell the uh, ethics canvas. And uh, yeah, during the development of, of this solution, actually we were using the Lean Startup methodology. So uh, we created first an, an MVP that uh, looked like this. And do you remember uh, Dave and Wessel? And uh, then uh, with some uh, feedback uh, during the workshops that we were running, uh, we were iterating it. So this was the first version, and the second, and the third one, uh, the fourth one, the fifth one. The, I really like this one, actually. <laughs> the, the, the layout is like, uh, I don't really care about what does it say, but uh, <laughs> it was really, really, really nice. I remember that it took me a while just to get this uh, <laughs> thing working. Um, uh, the seventh one and the eighth one, and this is the, the final one um, that uh, is available for everyone on uh, thiscanvas.org. Uh, both the paper, the, the printed version, and, uh, and the online version. So, um, as I said, uh, as, uh, as uh, Dave said, uh, I work in uh, Accenture Digital in, in Oslo. Accenture is uh, a large uh, corporation with uh, uh, a bit less than uh, 450,000 employees uh, in, uh, in uh, 120 countries. And um, I work in a digital that is uh, one of the divisions of Accenture that uh, what we do is uh, to create these um, uh, groundbreaking uh, customer experiences using cutting-edge technologies. And my role as a, a business integration manager is uh, precisely to experiment uh, with all these uh, emerging technologies and uh, try to identify if uh, we can use them uh, in order to provide more value to our clients or we can solve some uh, problems uh, with these tools. So um, 
uh, this, this evaluation is not only done from a business or technical perspective, uh, but as well from an ethical point of view, as uh, we will see uh, later. And uh, because ethics are really, really important uh, to us as part of our core values. And uh, we incorporate ethics in uh, research and uh, development uh, processes because it's the right thing to do, but as well, uh, as we will see later, it's uh, generating more value uh, for our clients and uh, as well it's opening new business opportunities. Um, during my experience with the uh, startups, uh, I had to admit that the ethics was never, never, ever a priority. So uh, just, uh, it's not ethics, uh, what we were doing is uh, just making sure that everything we did was uh, legally compliant, which was not easy uh, as well, especially it was before uh, GDPR, <laughs> but still it was not not easy. Uh, but uh, something that they learned is that uh, even apparently uh, harmless applications uh, can have, uh, can impact uh, humans in ways you never considered. And, uh, uh, as well, uh, Robin uh, provided some examples yesterday in uh, his talk about uh, how sensors uh, uh, could impact uh, humans. And uh, if, if you ask me why most startups historically never uh, consider ethics as one of the priorities, I could say that uh, when you are in a race against the clock uh, with a very limited budget, uh, trying to keep your burn rate very low, uh, without paying yourself a salary and uh, with uh, extreme uh, pressure from your investors. Now, in many cases, uh, in, in, in uh, seed investment, is uh, your parents or your neighbor or your best friend. So uh, normally your priorities are different. Um, your priorities are to validate the, the value proposition, just making sure that uh, you are solving a real problem and hopefully a very painful uh, problem uh, to your uh, customer segments and actually are you targeting the right customer segments, it, it's really important to know. As well, to make sure that uh, we find a sustainable business model and find this uh, product market fit and uh, finally, and really important, to generate revenue. Uh, because uh, generating revenue is uh, the ultimate uh, validation of your business. So having someone that is not your mother paying for your product is, uh, is great, it's is fantastic, it's uh, ultimate validation. Uh, but it's not only because of that, uh, actually you really need the money uh, in order to keep the business alive. And uh, if you want to raise uh, another uh, fund, uh, round of uh, investment in order to scale the solution up, you will need to be uh, revenue generating is an investor demand. Uh, so what uh, we can see here, it's uh, the uh, Gardner hype cycle for emerging technologies. Um, I see that uh, what, what I mentioned about the startups, uh, this paradigm has been changing a little bit during the last few years, not enough unfortunately. But uh, we see now like companies of uh, all sizes that uh, are starting to pay more attention to ethics in technology. And this seems to be like a responsible uh, response to um, uh, the emergence of technologies uh, that uh, have the potential to have a, a very big impact in uh, billions of people's lives uh, in a positive or in a negative way. Uh, so, in this uh, Gardner's uh, hype cycle for emerging technologies, this is uh, there's one every year. This is the one of uh, 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 last year. We will get the one from this year in uh, just a couple of weeks. Uh, this is a sort of a pipeline of all the uh, trends, all the cool technology that uh, is meant to uh, be used in the next uh, few years, and uh, we can see. Uh, for instance, uh, human uh, augmentation, uh, smart robots, uh, smart dust that remind me uh, the talk from Robin as well. Uh, smart dust are these uh, micro sensors uh, that uh, are like a millimeter scale and they can detect uh, anything from uh, vibration to light. And uh, to be honest, I don't really trust the things that I cannot see. 
<laughs> so uh, as well, of course, uh, artificial intelligence, ma machine learning, blockchain, they all can have uh, catastrophic uh, consequences if uh, ethics are neglected. And this one is the same um, hype cycle, but it's the first one that the governor published in uh, 1995, uh, 23 years ago. And we can see some uh, old friends like uh, wireless communications, wow! <laughs> and uh, yeah, virtual reality, video conferencing, uh, OCR, speech recognition. So uh, most of them had as well, back in the day, some uh, strong uh, ethical concerns. So what has changed in these uh, 23 years? One of the things that uh, as well, uh, Philip mentioned yesterday uh, was about the uh, education. Uh, education. So uh, in the 90s, uh, ethics was not part of the curricula of uh, IT um, degrees at all. And in many universities, it's not uh, there yet. Uh, but uh, perhaps the most important uh, facts are that uh, these technologies have unprecedented levels of potential harm in, uh, in society, in humans. Not only if they are used uh, for bad on purpose, but as well if there's some uh, sort of uh, misuse, or basically if um, we don't use it with uh, enough care and diligence. As well due to the current uh, social media um, communication setting, so this uh, technology can uh, spread from zero to billions of uh, people within hours. Then technology is no longer a privilege of uh, all these uh, large corporations like uh, decades ago um, that were the only ones that could afford using uh, these cutting edge uh, technologies. Nowadays, um, access, development, and knowledge on all these uh, technologies is extremely affordable, can be free, and uh, it's uh, available as well to small, medium sized enterprises and uh, freelancers, uh, and this is accelerating the pace of new technologies into this uh, pipeline. It's uh, increasing the innovation and creativity, and this makes uh, it even more challenging from an ethics uh, point of view. And uh, finally, related to the third point, uh, the reshape of the global workforce, uh, now we have uh, more and more freelancers and more uh, small medium-sized enterprises uh, and less people working for these uh, large corporations. And if we look at uh, some stats, uh, at the moment 99% um, of the businesses in the European Union are small medium-sized businesses, uh, which generate uh, two-thirds of the total employment and generate as well 57% of the value added in our economy. So, uh, as I said, more and more companies are now uh, implementing ethics into their research and innovation processes. Unfortunately, not enough. Uh, but uh, they do it probably because it's the right thing to do. Uh, but as well, there's another reason. Uh, it's uh, business value and the business opportunities associated to it. This is um, the business model canvas from uh, Alex uh, Osterwalder and uh, Yves Spinier, which is uh, a broadly used uh, brainstorming tool that uh, helps uh, entrepreneurs brainstorm about uh, the business model of uh, their ideas or their, their projects. And it's, uh, now it's like a standard in the entrepreneurial community. So, uh, here, what uh, people start doing is uh, reflecting about uh, who are your customers, then uh, what value do you provide to each one of the customer segments, which is really important, and uh, how do you make money out of it. But in the business model canvas, the, the value the value is the key, uh, is uh, the, the most important thing. And uh, basically, if you don't have a very, very compelling value proposition, that makes your customer segments, uh, that makes your customers uh, to, to use your solution, pay for your solution instead of going to your competitors. So you are actively encouraged to just pivot your idea and try to find a product market fit 
or just to let it go, don't waste more time and money, and just uh, find a normal job. Uh, but uh, what about if the fact of uh, having uh, ethically informed solutions that uh, are targeted to the growing number of uh, ethically concerned customers was part of our core value proposition? And uh, it could become uh, as well a very, very robust competitive advantage. So, having a look at uh, some stats, 56% uh, uh, of the Americans uh, would stop buying from brands they believe are unethical. And 29% uh, of them uh, share their support of ethical companies on social media, so it's helping them to improve their reputation as uh, ethical companies. And 70% of uh, these uh, Americans say that uh, they are influenced to purchase products or services based on the company's ethics. Some other stats uh, closer to us in the, in the UK, uh, for the last uh, almost uh, 20 years uh, we can see that uh, the spending in ethical products or services has grown a lot and is, uh, keeps uh, growing year by year. And 50% uh, of these uh, consumers find uh, important the ethics uh, credentials of the company before uh, buying uh, or purchasing some uh, products or services. And this is especially more important uh, among young generations. So this is a very, very positive. So here we are not talking about um, uh, having a box like this, hopefully better design. I just created this with uh, PowerPoint. Um, uh, on, on the company's website, we're not talking about that, uh, having this, uh, this, uh, this batch uh, where an uh, ethical authority uh, would say if uh, your solution, your product is ethical or not. Because uh, this would raise many questions about uh, um, who, is, uh, who is making those decisions, uh, which criteria is being used, uh, does it apply to all the markets, all the solutions, and uh, it would probably end up with uh, a huge business of uh, certifications of uh, uh, being uh, ethical, like uh, ethically certified as it's happening as well with uh, many other methodologies uh, like um, Agile and uh, Lean Startup and, and even the business model canvas. So we're not uh, talking about that. Uh, it's more the idea that uh, the teams, they have to reflect about uh, these uh, ethical, potential ethical implications of uh, their ideas, their products and services at very early stage. And uh, then they can decide based on the company's uh, values and the culture. This relates as well uh, to uh, Jerome's uh, talk yesterday um, and decide if uh, they need to do something about it uh, and bring those um, those impacts, uh, all these uh, ethics uh, insights into the design phase. Practicing ethics uh, as part of the uh, uh, tech company's uh, way of work is uh, as well a shield against future reputational uh, damage for, for a company. And uh, as we saw in a previous study, it can even help us to enhance uh, our reputation. In the age of social media, uh, even a, a hundred year old uh, business that has like a very good reputation uh, can have a, the, this reputation destroyed within hours uh, if uh, ethics are neglected. So uh, every year the insurance company Alliance, they publish this uh, um, risk, business risk barometer where they evaluate the major threats for our, the different sorts of uh, businesses. So the first risk that uh, they identify, and this happens every year, makes sense, is a business interruption that can be caused by, uh, um, uh, can be caused by uh, uh, different uh, reasons such as uh, natural catastrophes or technical failures, but as well uh, ransomware, for instance. 
Uh, the second one is uh, these uh, so-called uh, cyber hurricanes, uh, such as uh, WAC, right, for instance. Uh, but as well, all these uh, data breaches uh, that uh, bring uh, huge reputation, reputation damage, and as well large fines, especially after the introduction of uh, GDPR. And uh, number seven are the unexpected consequences of the application of these new technologies, uh, unknown technologies, uh, such as AI, uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, vehicles, or for instance, uh, smart factories, uh, that uh, we don't know enough about, uh, we don't know about all the consequences, and they can impact uh, the customer trust and uh, bring um, harm to, to the business reputation. So, uh, some cases that we can see is, uh, for instance, the, the iPhone X, uh, this case uh, was quite famous that, uh, because perhaps uh, they were not using a data training data set that was uh, comprehensive enough. Uh, there were some cases, not many, but uh, some cases of uh, uh, Chinese users that could unlock with the face recognition uh, functionality other Chinese users' uh, phones. So that was viral and they have to apologize about that. And uh, another one that was very popular was um, K, it's the name of a chatbot that uh, Microsoft created with a, with a, initially it had like an innocent uh, teenage girl uh, personality. And uh, within 24 hours, K uh, was learning from uh, tweets from other users and uh, after 24 hours, she was saying things like this. Uh, so Microsoft had to shut it down. Uh, it brought as well like a huge uh, uh, damage to their reputation. Uh, we have some cases as well about uh, uh, Google uh, translation, uh, some machine translation bias. And uh, for example, this is interesting as well as a uh, uh, brain preserving solution that uh, basically uploads your memories to the cloud for a virtual afterlife. Wow, who wants that? <laughs> but uh, still, uh, it's, it gets even better because uh, they have to kill you first uh, in order to do that. <laughs> so this was uh, as well many um, protests on uh, protests on social media and uh, MIT that was one of the uh, supporters, they have to cut like uh, all the all the ties with uh, with this startup. So uh, this is why it's um, so important to incorporate uh, ethics in the innovation and research uh, uh, processes in order to detect at very early stage these uh, potential ethical impacts on uh, individuals and uh, groups and society itself. But uh, if we think about um, ourselves as entrepreneurs, addressing these concerns is, is not only uh, good for, for everyone, but as well, it's going to enrich our value proposition and uh, hopefully differentiate us from uh, competitors and uh, protect our businesses for future uh, potential um, uh, reputational uh, damage. So using tools such as the Ethics Canvas in combination with the uh, Business Model Canvas in order to brainstorm about um, uh, both the business model and the, let's call it, uh, ethical model of, uh, of our uh, product can uh, help us to uh, detect and pivot at uh, very early stage and as well save money. We won't waste time on things that uh, can have a lot of uh, uh, problems uh, in the future. Um, this is uh, the Data Ethics Canvas. So uh, the Ethics Canvas, I forgot to say that it's uh, open source. Uh, it has a Creative Commons uh, license. And uh, I was really, really glad to see uh, that uh, other uh, institutions have created canvases inspired on the Ethics Canvas. This is the probably the most popular one. Uh, uh, it's uh, mostly about identifying and managing ethical impacts on uh, data practices and it's, uh, it was created by the um, Open Data Institute that is uh, an organization uh, founded by uh, Sir, um, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, who is the creator of the web. Let's talk about um, 
this uh, ethics movement that uh, we can see in the civil society, because uh, after all these scandals uh, from uh, well, data leaks and uh, hacks and uh, surveillance scandals, so uh, individu individuals are not only concerned about uh, privacy, uh, about uh, ethics, they are already kick-starting some uh, civil movements uh, with uh, using ad blockers or using um, encrypted services or uh, different uh, types of uh, protests in order to uh, to request, to demand uh, more rights. And uh, businesses and uh, organizations and civil society, they are starting to take measures uh, in order to put, uh, to place the humans at the center. Um, some people might argue that, uh, including myself, that uh, these measures are still insufficient. But uh, for instance, we can talk about uh, GDPR and uh, PSD2. PSD2 is the payments regulation. So uh, this is providing more rights uh, to, uh, to individuals. Uh, but as well, it has become a compliance nightmare for businesses and uh, in the case of PSD2 for banks. But uh, if you think about uh, specifically about the PSD2, uh, now the banks are starting to create uh, they, they have to open uh, with this uh, regulation, their uh, APIs, their services to other startups so, they, uh, so that they could interact using the same customer base. So initially it was uh, from a security point of view, was a nightmare, but now they are creating ecosystems around their customers and their banks, and this is a really, really profitable business opportunity. And uh, yeah. In the sense of uh, ethics in technology, uh, I like to compare it with uh, environmental uh, practices, business practices, or uh, being green, uh, with green business practices. Because uh, decades ago, in the businesses, uh, being environmentally friendly was nothing. It was not uh, adopted at all. But now it has become an investor demand. It has become a legal requirement and as well a competitive advantage and I think that it will be uh, pretty much the same hopefully for ethics in technology. Talking about uh, ethics in, uh, in Accenture, the company where I work, so we are constantly experimenting with uh, all these uh, emerging technologies and as, as I said my goal is uh, evaluating them from a technical business and as well ethical point of view if uh, we need to implement them and we normally do that through uh, some um, what we call design sprints that are normally uh, five days long sometimes it's uh, less time and it has different phases where we ideate the solution so the input is just uh, a, perhaps a vague idea of uh, what the problem is and uh, who might be the customers and uh, during these uh, days we have a workshop with different innovators and, uh, and uh, business uh, owners in order to first uh, understand what the problem is, uh, who are the customers. Um, and uh, then we start the brainstorming session where we try to diverge and uh, think about potential solutions uh, without uh, deciding if it's feasible or not. Just uh, we can have like very crazy ideas. Uh, about that, and uh, after some days as well, we start to uh, converge again and decide what is the the best approach for the moment uh, uh, for for this uh, problem, uh, which is the best solution. And then we do some session of uh, quick prototyping in order to start learning as well as possible. So where does the uh, found here, so the, the answer is everywhere, so we, we know that in all these spaces, so that uh, we have uh, kind of a checkbox that uh, we have in all the places and uh, we start reflecting and we use the sticky notes everywhere in order to identify what are the potential ethical impacts of everything that is being discussed. As well, uh, well in, in Accenture, uh, we, we have all our employees have uh, mandatory uh, trainings on uh, how to use uh, emerging technologies and how to use uh, data. And uh, we are actively encouraged to speak up uh, if we have different uh, 
ethical concerns about the technology, the technology that we are using, about the uh, usage of, of data, and we, uh, we have different channels as well to do that. We have a confidential ethical line and even a chatbot that is called Co, uh, that uh, gives uh, advice when ethical con concerns arise. And uh, well, uh, that's uh, perhaps uh, like a set of uh, uh, things that we do in, in Accenture why we have been nominated uh, uh, for 11 years in a row as uh, one of the world's more, most uh, ethical companies. So, I have, uh, I think, just a very few minutes, uh, right? Uh, yeah, so let's reflect uh, about uh, what are we doing in the industry uh, to showcase uh, ethics as a very strong uh, and compelling business value uh, in, uh, and uh, competitive advantage. So, uh, we're going to start as well with an example that reminds me what uh, I think uh, Murat is not here uh, today, but he was talking about something really important that is AI fairness, um, which is uh, some cases when we discriminate some uh, groups, uh, some normally minorities in the uh, AI artificial intelligence algorithms. So. Uh, Accenture has created a, a tool uh, that uh, actually has been uh, released uh, two weeks ago uh, in order to detect, help business to detect and eliminate this uh, unfair uh, bias in, in the algorithms. Because at the moment, uh, you see, like many companies and institu institutions are using um, AI in order to make critical decisions, really critical decisions, like. Uh, uh, who to hire, or uh, who gets uh, government uh, benefits, and um, as well who gets a, a mortgage, or even who gets a prisoner's uh, parole. So there's a case uh, uh, some some time ago. Um, there was an algorithm that was being used in the states in order to decide uh, or to to help make uh, bail um, bail decisions. And uh, this algorithm was twice as likely to uh, falsely label black prisoners uh, to, to become uh, potential re-offenders as white uh, prisoners. So this is just an, an, a real case of uh, something that uh, can go really wrong. So just an algorithm that uh, has this bias. In the perhaps uh, because the way it was uh, programmed or the data set that they used in order to train it, and uh, this tool, for instance, and many others uh, can uh, help to remove uh, the impact of these sensitive variables such as the race or uh, the sexual uh, orientation or um, or the ethnic or uh, nationality in order to to make this uh, in order to impact these uh, minorities. So uh, this reminds me exactly uh, what uh, Murad was, was saying and is a, a big problem now in, in AI. It's one of the biggest problems. Uh, as well, there are many cases of uh, startups that are raising funds uh, and they are working in uh, ethics uh, at the moment. So uh, Conversant is one of them. It was historic, historically working as uh, basically business ethics, but now they are transitioning and incorporating some features of uh, ethics in technology, and they raised uh, 25 million. As well, there are different funds, like this one that was created by uh, the CEO of LinkedIn and other, um, um, other entrepreneurs uh, in order to fund research on, on AI to be used for good. There's this other partnership uh, where 50 of the largest companies in the world, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, IBM, Accenture, Many others uh, are supporting uh, research and best practices on uh, AI specifically uh, and fostering public understanding on, on AI, what's happening there. And uh, for instance, uh, Google as well, they published recently their ethical principles on how to use AI in technology. Uh, and among these seven principles, uh, we can highlight that it has to be socially uh, beneficial, of course. Uh, it shouldn't introduce or reinforce this bias that we just uh, saw and limit potential harmful um, uh, uh, applications that could uh, contravene 
international laws or uh, human rights. For instance, uh, Google um, has said that they won't uh, develop any AI for weapons, for using in weapons. So just to conclude with, um, so the pace of uh, all these emerging uh, technologies is accelerating, and uh, this is increasing the challenges in, in terms of uh, ethics. As well, the customer habits are shifting and taking uh, ethics into account, that I think is, uh, is very good. Uh, we can see some movements as well uh, from uh, the industry in order to adopt uh, ethics in technology as part of their innovation process. There's still a long way to go, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, I would say that uh, businesses want to be where their customers are. So uh, I think it's uh, positive, uh, we are uh, on the right direction. And uh, hopefully uh, these businesses and as well uh, organizations and uh, civil society will understand ethics as a very strong value uh, in, uh, in, the, in any project, any uh, technical project, and as well a very clear competitive advantage. That's uh, all I have to say. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions.